I have always liked the song um, Life on Mars by David Bowie, uh, but just in the last couple days or so, something has clicked in my mind and the song took on this kind of new reality where just everything is meaningful. Um, and so I have a bunch of thoughts about the lyrics to this song. I will probably um, also be doing videos on changes and uh, Oh You Pretty Things from the same album, Hunky Dory, uh, David Bowie's Hunky Dory, 1971. And, and they're all sort of connected. Uh, it's possible that I'll end up tackling a lot more of that album too, because if, if three songs seem to have connections, then there could be themes across the others too. Right now I'm just doing Life on Mars because that's the one I sort of have the, the most of, most thoughts of at the moment. Um, so if you aren't familiar with the song, I recommend you go and listen to it uh, um, before or after uh, watching this video of mine, or preferably both, uh, before and after and during. Um, it means a lot to me. It's a good song. So, lyrics starting. At this point, I'm assuming that you've become familiar with the song um, and come back to me. Um, it's a god-awful small affair. What is, we're not sure yet. To the girl with the mousy hair. So now we have a character, the girl with mousy hair. And you can probably assume that a person described as having mousy hair is probably mousy in general. So we've got a mousy little girl. But her mummy is yelling no. And her daddy has told her to go. Grown-ups yelling at her, um, telling her what to do. Um, she's not saying anything. Parents are saying things to her. Um, but her friend is nowhere to be seen. Now she walks through her sunken dream. This may just be me reading my own personality and to whatever. But what I'm seeing is um, um, an autistic child who is um, being told what to do. She has no voice of her own. At least she's not using it if she does. And um, then uh, her friend is nowhere to be seen. Possibly an imaginary friend. I'm not sure. Now she walks through her sunken dream. I don't know about you, but I have walked through some sunken dreams in my day where it's like, it's not real. You're it's a sunken dream. You're just below where you should be is not real. Um, so she walks through a sunken dream to the seat with the clearest view and she's hooked to the silver screen. Okay, so literally speaking, she's going to get a view of the movie screen because she's going to watch a movie. I doubt that this is actually just a song about a girl going to the movies. Um, uh, I'm just going to jump ahead and say that she watching the screen to me is um, watching what we consider real life and feeling separated from it. Like she's not in the world. The world is as if on a screen. But the film is a saddening bore for she's lived it 10 times or more. Um, you know, she's going through the same things again and again. Um, she could spit in the eyes of fools as they, as they offered, ask her to focus on sailors fighting in the dance hall. Presumably that's the subject of the movie. I think that sailors fighting in the dance hall is basically just sort of um, people at not their best they are just you know getting into a fight over something stupid the dance hall was the place you would have done that in the 60s i'm picturing the mods and rockers getting in fights these are sailors at i'm sure the sailors do the fighting too and 
they ask her to focus on Sarah's fighting in the dance hall. Is they her parents? Is they filmmakers? I don't know, but essentially the message is, this is reality. This is what you should be pointing at. Pointing your face at, your eyes. Sailors fighting in the dance hall. Oh, look at those cavemen go. As I said, these are the sailors in fighting in the dance hall are, they're crude, they're exhibiting, you know, base features of humanity. Um, sure, they might as well be cavemen. And I'll be talking more about this when we get to Oh You Pretty Things. But if she sees them as cavemen, she is not just apart from them, but above them. As though she's just like, these are people from millions of years ago. And, um, okay, not millions of years ago. She's not an archaeologist. Maybe, say, you know, 50,000 years ago. And, um, and she's above that. She has evolved beyond that. That evolution idea I will get into more, as I said, with Oh You Pretty Things. Um, oh man, look at those cavemen go. It's the freakiest show. Again, it's freaky. It's alien to her. Um, these allegedly normal people around her, you know, fighting in the dance hall are just... They're foreign. It's freaky. They're cavemen. Take a look at the lawman beating up the wrong guy. Now, just as much as then, more than then, the lawman is beating up the wrong guy. Oh, man. Wonder if he'll ever know he's in the best-selling show. She is watching this movie of reality outside of her head. Um, and she's wondering if the guy in the movie knows that he's a character in this movie. Um, so that's, you know, blurring levels of what's real and what's not real. Um, and uh, um, also it's, you know, it's, it's this idea of um, generally speaking, um, you know, outside of certain you know, wacky shows or whatever. A character does not know that they're a character in a story. Um, but if a character did become aware that they are a character, that they're playing this role, um, they would achieve essentially a state of enlightenment. If not a permanent maximum enlightenment, then at least more enlightened than their ignorant peers. They get level of consciousness above. <laughs> Then the key line, is there life on Mars? Um, that just feels like what it's saying is, um, if you think about, you know, if you see someone who, you know, maybe be having mental problems or, you know, is somehow catatonic, for example, you say things like, um, there's no one in there, the lights are on, but nobody's home. Um, is there life on Mars really sort of feels like that to me? That is just my interpretation out of my little brain, but it feels like that's what it's saying. And coming after the line about wonder if he'll ever know if he's in the best-selling show, is there life on Mars? In that case, then um, Mars is apparently a dead planet. Uh, apparently there isn't life on there, but we have always been wondering if there's, as long as we've known that it was a planet, we've thought about Martians' life on Mars. Um, it's the closest planet. Um, it's relatively the kind of place where life could be. Um, it's not just gas or whatever. It And then, um, I mean, for a long time, there could have been life on it and we wouldn't have known. Since then, we've explored the surface with rovers and whatnot. And while... Um, on one side, we don't see any of it anywhere. Um, this is after Bowie's time, by the time we get the rovers. But at the same time, there, there's evidence on Mars that there has been water at some point, and liquid water being um, necessary for life as we know it. 
Um, there could have been life on Mars. So the idea of life on Mars, um, like, we don't see that there's life on Mars, but there sort of could be somehow. That feels to me like what she's, like, to represent what she's thinking when she sees these people on the screen and wonders essentially if they have consciousness, if there's, if, if there's anyone, um, in there. Um, but also I hear it at the same time as, um, what these adults see when they see this, um, mousy withdrawn child, um, seems autistic to me, uh, does not speak in the course of uh, what we've seen so far in the song. Um, is there life on Mars? Is there anything in Mouse Girl's head? My interpretation, take it or leave it as you wish. Back to lyrics. It's on America's tortured brow that Mickey Mouse has grown up a cow. Okay, yeah, I really have no interpretation for her, uh, yet. Now the workers have struck for fame because Lennon's on sale again. Um, I feel like this is sort of, you know, society's, you know, I, exaltation of, of fame, um, workers striking for fame instead of money. Um, because Lennon's on sale again. I think that's one of the uh, lyrics I found online. I'll say, well, of course they all say the same thing because lyric sites all use one source. Okay. They all spell it L-E-N-N-O-N because Lennon, John Lennon, is on sale. Um, that goes to the idea, like I said, of, you know, things being very commercial. Um, I mean, he knew John Lennon. Uh, the Beatles actually had an album. One of their UK albums that was not originally released in the United States is called Beatles for Sale because even though it was still um, very early in their careers from 1964, they were feeling so overwhelmed by you know Beatlemania and everybody wanting a piece of them and feeling that they were you know, for sale. Um, so it makes sense that that could be about Lennon. It works, John Lennon, it works in many ways. It's also funny, though, um, with David Bowie, we don't read the word Lennon, we hear him say it. And Lennon, as in John Lennon, sounds basically the same as Lennon, as in Vladimir Ilyich Lennon of the Russian Revolution and the Soviet, um, uh, Union, next word, Soviet Union. Um, and then it's kind of funny because then it's like, oh, even communism is for, is capitalist these days if Lenin is for sale. Um, that's actually kind of prophetic because back then we had multiple hardline communist countries. Um, and now the only major country, um, the only major world player that still calls itself communist is China, and they are arguably the biggest capitalists of all. Um, so that's nothing there. Either could go either way there. See the mice in their million hordes, from Ibiza to the Norfolk Broads. My guess is that just she's seeing people who are running around doing their thing as like mice. Um, I, hold on just a moment. <laughs> 